a larger purpose in building Angel City, which is true equity. We realized the importance of using our platform and our voice to draw attention to something bigger, and then the vehicle that you come together is something joyful and fun and competitive. And in this case, women professional soccer players in the U.S. are the best in the world. It is an incredible product on the pitch. So when you participate with Angel City, not only are you driving to equity, but you're also celebrating these incredible athletes and giving them an experience they deserve that they haven't had before. Welcome to Los Angeles, home of Angel City FC, the buzziest women's pro soccer team in the U.S. It's a new generation of ownership that's boosting the profile of the National Women's Soccer League. Their goal? To unlock the next big sports business opportunity, run it like a fast-growing tech startup, invent a new playbook for sports franchises around the world, and change culture. I'm sitting down with the club's three founders in their first ever joint interview. I mean, we've been together in lots of places, but we've interview. not done like a formal interview like this together. Yeah. Oh, I like her sweatshirt. I know, we need to make more of those. Why does Natalie get the best stuff? I Again, mean, she's <laughs> Natalie Portman. I know, but I'm Karen I feel Norman. like you answered your own question. Oh. Hi, babe. Hi, guys. <laughs> Good to see you again. Do you get nervous? Before every game? Before an interview, no. Before a game, I, I walk around with a trash bag. Yeah. <laughs> and they're like, Julie, we prepared as much as we can. I'm like, that doesn't comfort me. We're gonna start with the clap because I just learned the clap. Excellent. All right? Yeah. One, two, three, ha! All right, ready. Natalie, I've heard you tell this beautiful story. Like, wasn't it your son that got you hooked and also made you realize that maybe we could change how we view women's sports? We were watching the Women's World Cup and I saw my son who was, I think, seven at the time, idolizing the female players in the same way that he idolized the male players. When I saw him wanting a Rapino jersey and an Alex Morgan jersey and a Christian Press jersey, just as much as he wanted the Messi and Mbappe and Griezmann jerseys, I was like, this is a way to change culture. Like, what a different world. Of course, we know for girls, it means so much to have female athletes to look up to, but for boys to look up to women also, it's really for everyone. I mean, this just started out as a kernel of an idea, and now you are breaking attendance records. What was the spark that lit the fire that got you to start Angel City? Well, Kara and I met at a Time's Up event. Time's Up was at a group of women in various industries working towards equity. And here are the all-male nominees. <laughs> We met some of the female players from the U.S. national team and heard their fight for pay equity. It really helped us understand that soccer was an incredible opportunity to use something joyful to spread equity. Then Kara brought Julie on, who they had known each other forever, and she has been leading us since. So it's been an incredible group effort. Kara, you're a venture capitalist, and so you've spent years trying to make tech companies profitable. Like, what is the plan to turn Angel City into the next unicorn? Yeah, well, I, I think we should get rid of that word unicorn at this point. <laughs> All right, like, it's gone. Sustainable gone. business that can keep breaking through glass ceilings and all ceilings. Um, we talk about product market fit a lot in tech, uh, which means you're actually trying to build to a new consumer end user behavior that may not exist. In sports, we're literally trying to put butts in seats. And so once you put the butts in the seats, every other revenue stream flows from that. There's incredibly valuable rights, media rights, merchandising rights, gaming rights, all of these different rights that flow from putting the butts in the seats and people being able to follow it. And so we have a plan to be the first $100 million revenue business in women's sports. And I think we're constantly sort of trying to figure out how to do the core things, really bring in mission aligned sponsors while building to new revenue streams that may be even more innovative than the men's side. Yeah, well, that's the point, right? You've got this ownership group filled with all of these powerful collaborators, mostly women. What kind of energy do they bring to the table? Like different than a traditional male owner? Would. It's incredibly different. It's a majority female ownership group and we all came together because we wanted to drive to equity. And for players, that's pay equity, but it's viewership equity, it's media attention, and I think it's really propelled us to where we are today. 
The game has been changing slowly. I mean, huge milestone, obviously, the pay equity settlement between the women's and men's national team. Does it feel like the game is changing? I had a chance to be at the uh, sold out Euro finals at Wembley, and we were all there again at a sold out Wembley for the US England game. But you're also seeing sold out stadiums in New Zealand for the Black Ferns women's cricket in India. 25,000 fans show up to watch the fourth division Newcastle team, the first time the women play in the men's stadiums. It's this moment in time where when you show people it's possible, more people try. I do joke around that it took, now I should say the female Thor, the queen of Star Wars. <laughs> to, <laughs> who are you talking about? It literally took Natalie t saying, why don't we bring a team to LA? And initially I was like, that sounds really hard. <laughs> and she said, don't you know how to do these things? And I'm like, I, yeah, but you need X, Y, and Z. You need a stadium, you need you know, investors, you need a president, you need all of these different things. The reason I think it's changing so quickly now is because the world has wanted it for a very long time. And you know, I think we hit the market in the right way and there's continuing to be examples set as to why it's possibilities and all the different ways it can show up in different cities and countries. And so more and more people will put real money in and will attempt to do things that they thought were impossible three or four years ago. The bigger ambition here is, is about changing the economics of women's sports, right? How is Angel City trying to drive value back to players, back to the community? We're one of the first teams to have a percentage of jersey sales go back to the players, percentage of all of the um, sponsorships go back into the community. So it's been an incredible way that we can give back a little bit to the community that has brought such incredible energy to this game. Tech people love data, sports people love data. How are you building the team to set it up for success using those building blocks? We want to build a winning team, so we want to find the best players in each position. But we also care about building a diverse team, about building a team that's relatable, that's reflective of our community, that are Los Angeles, so you can come see your favorite player that may have played at your high school or played at your college. That's important to us because it's about building community and a sense of belonging. And so we think about the international star, the U.S. star, the high school star. How can we build a team where you can ultimately see yourself and want to be a fan of? Opening day, how does it feel? How is the team gelling looking to you? I'm team looking looks, at you. You're looking at me. The team <laughs> looks incredible. We made some amazing additions in the offseason, including Alyssa Thompson, who's our homegrown hero, high school student from Harvard Westlake, Woo! graduating this year. Um, but we have a sold out crowd tonight for our home opener, and we couldn't be more excited. sports game needs a few things. A packed stadium, passionate fans, killer swag, good food, and serious star power. For that Lakers or Yankees level prestige, the owners did something special, bringing on both Hollywood A-listers and elite sports champions as investors. Of the sweater vest. Oh my God, That is like you. neon green. Because I love this. Thing. Thank you, I'm basically wearing a blanket. Of all the things you do, what does it mean to be part of the ownership group of a women's soccer team? Anytime there's powerful women at the center of what I do, it's very exciting for me. I encourage everyone to wait 10 minutes after the game is done, because that's actually my favorite part, because you'll see so many young girls, boys, everyone in between in the stands cheering for their favorite athletes on the field. So they're, they're already heroes, is that what you're saying? And they're already heroes. The world is just behind. Is there any part of you you're like, oh, I wish I was on the pitch? Are you like, you know what? It's somebody else's time. I, I think, you know, it's definitely someone else's time. I think I maybe have one good run in me before a hamstring <laughs> pops. But, you know, you just see the growth of the game. Just players are more technical. They're fitter, faster, stronger. You've played for teams all over the world. How is Angel City different? You know, here in L.A., we're grasping for airtime with a lot of different sports. So I think, one, it's the product you put on the field is very important. 
but also the environment in which you create for your supporters is just as important to make sure that they're valued and cared for. I've heard you say that you're still fighting for equality. When you play for the U.S. Women's National Team, you're handed a torch and you're asked to carry it as high as you can on behalf of women um, and women's equality. Um, so reaching that milestone was amazing. I can't even put words to it. The World Cup is like a shooting star moment, right? When you win a World Cup, it changes the trajectory of sport in your country. Tristan Press hands the United States in front. You as an investor, like, do you want to make money too? Making money? No, I don't want to make any money. <laughs> Who wants to make money? We're in it to show the world that there is a potential that is not being tapped into. And we've said that forever. Like, I don't care where you fall on the spectrum of loving or hating women's sports, you're missing the boat here. Of all the things that you're a part of, of all the things you can put your money behind, why Angel City? Uh, because in 2019, I drunkenly tweeted from the Women's World Cup that women's soccer was the most undervalued opportunity in sports. And a bunch of people on Twitter said, all right, you know what, Alexis, put your money where your mouth is. Serena's an investor, Olympia's also yes, an she's investor. The, she's the youngest, Olympia I made sure, she's the youngest owner in pro sports. What does it mean to you that your daughter will be able to watch the rise in the story of this team? Frankly, she's getting a lot of inspiration all around her. Obviously her mother is, uh, is quite long on that. And so I'm just doing my part. I'm a competitive parent. I want her to be proud of lots of the stuff that her papa does. You know a thing or two about building billion dollar companies. Can Angel City do it? Can they turn this into a billion dollar franchise? 100%, over the next five, even 10 years, you're gonna watch the ascent, not just of Angel City, but of uh, NWSL franchises really catching up with the MLS, and I would say even surpassing. And, and that's because we think of American greatness in soccer, it is women, unequivocally. global brand allows everything else to happen. If you're a global brand, you draw the most attention and awareness. Then I can capture that fan base and try to convert them into Angel City fans, get them to pay for merch, get them to come to games. When someone comes to a game, 1% of our gate receipts goes back to our players. When a sponsor wants to align with us because we have the largest audience and we're value aligned, 10% of their sponsorship dollars goes back into the community through our equity, essentials, and education platform. So the larger I get and the more exposure and I can bring them into the Angel City family, the more impact I can have for my players and our community. Do you feel the culture changing? I mean, it takes generations to build serious fandom and you've done it in like a few years? Oh, I mean, that's the thing about this that's so special, and you'll feel it tonight, the electricity. It's like if you look in the stadium tonight, it represents Los Angeles. It's, you know, it's pretty equally male, female, black, white, brown, gay, straight. It's, it's like, it is LA. I always talk about sports as socially acceptable tribalism and like the highs and the lows. You have a Democrat and Republican sitting next to each other may not even realize it and they're hugging each other. I think for me personally, as someone um, who's kind of been passionate about gender equity, I think as we all have our, our whole lives, this, it's a place where diversity in the investment group, in the C-suite, in the coaching staff, is driving outcomes. I really firmly believe that joyful movements is a much faster way to prove the DEI case than anything else. And it's seeing them hand in hand is making change quickly. <laughs> it's been five years since Time's Up, five years since Brotopia. I mean, we're talking about all this progress, but do you ever feel like it, we've, we've lost some of the progress or that sometimes things are moving backwards? I think that our path is never gonna be linear. For us to think that um, everything's gonna be perfect and kumbaya all the way through is not paying homage to the fact that everything good in life is hard. We all also have to be able to make mistakes, be different, hit setbacks, and not feel shame or badly about it. We just do our best work, try to learn from it and get better. And um, oh, I get the chill saying this, but like today feels different even than last year because these women are like my sisters now. You have each other's backs. You let each other, you know, sometimes take three steps forward, even if it means you take one or two steps back. And I think that is the way to progress. How would you answer that question, obviously, in Hollywood? Is it ever a few steps forward and a few steps back? Yeah, I think that there were a lot of great strides made. Um, and of course, then there's also, you know, always things that are happening in the world. There's different challenges that women are facing everywhere. 
and will continue to face, unfortunately, for a long time. But that's what makes all of this even more meaningful. The whole goal is to uplift these women and value them the way they deserve to be valued. The league has grappled with allegations of sexual assault and harassment, and I know a number of coaches have resigned or left. Do you feel like that's fully behind the league? Yeah, I mean, I would say it is behind the league, which is to say we've addressed the past and we're putting in rules and policies and procedures to make sure that we have a safe and secure environment for our players, an opportunity that to voice any concerns, and the training of our staff and coaches to create an environment where our players can actually be the best they can be. It would be my naive to say that it's over and nothing will ever happen again, but we are working hard to create the safest and best environment for our players. There was this sense of women always competing against each other, but you learned how to compete as a team, as a team of women. Has Angel City helped drive that point home, like watching these women compete yes. as a team? It's like the perfect model for, for girls and women to learn from, to see all these women like jumping on top of each other when one of them scores. And it's how we all try to support each other too. Stop, and here we go, another corner kick for Angel City. So when you look across the landscape, where do you see other places to elevate women and women leaders in the game that'll trickle all the way down to the youth level? I think about like me as a mom, my kids play soccer. Like I want them to experience this beautiful world that we are all driving towards. Where do you see the gaps and what else needs to change? First and foremost is just uh, the distribution of, of the actually being able to watch the games. Last year, if you wanted to watch all the Angel City games, you had to subscribe, I think, to four or five different streaming services, right. one of which was only in Spanish. You have so, to work hard to be a fan. So there, as yes. you say, there are no lazy female sports fans. They don't no. exist. So we aspire for lazy fans. You know, like that would be great. So I think high quality content that makes us feel connected to the, the story of these players' lives is really important. And then I think the final thing is, we're at the earliest phases. We have, you know, 12 teams going to a few more. In most mature men's leagues, you have 30 to 36 teams. And yeah. so getting teams in cities, so you guys can show up in your hometown with yeah. your sons. Um, and so it is a little bit like the NFL or NBA probably in the 80s or 90s. And so more places you can touch and feel it in the real world and digitally will just naturally take on its own life. Yeah. Have you traded notes with any of the other ownership groups? Every like, chance we Are guys. they calling you and saying like, how can I do this? All the time. And we all three of us always say, call us up. We'll help however we can. Move playbooks over. Share our models. And I mean, I think it's like, it's almost like the open source movement. I think of it as like open sourcing what works because you're going to see such cool innovation in different ways in Kansas versus North Carolina versus Louisville and, yeah, and wherever yeah, yeah. else. There's more teams coming to the U.S. And we've also actually seen the women's club game in Europe kind of take off. How are you watching what's happening in Europe and how, how does it compare to what's happening in the United States? I mean, the growth in women's football is everywhere. I mean, you see it when Chelsea plays Arsenal, you see when Barcelona plays at Camp Nou, you see it at the Euro finals, you're seeing it at the FIFA World Cup this year when they changed the stadium to a stadium that was twice as big because they already sold out the tickets. Yeah. The reality is people want to watch women's sports. It's not an anomaly that we have a sold out crowd today. We've got the momentum from the Men's World Cup, but the women have won, the U.S. women have won two World Cups in a row. When it comes to that level of the game, when are women gonna get the recognition that they deserve? Well, I hope it's this year. They fought hard and won a lawsuit against U.S. soccer for equal pay. FIFA saying they'll equal prize money by 2027. And I think this is just another opportunity to show the world how incredible they are and how deserving they are of equality. It was a $200 billion event, the Men's World Cup. I mean, I believe that's one of the biggest in history. I mean, what I mean come on. Listen, <laughs> a billion people watched the last Women's World Cup. A billion. I mean, that's just amazing. Yeah. And that was a huge part of what allowed us to come together in joint purpose to realize we definitely needed to find this woman. <laughs> um, you know, of course we want things to be completely equal overnight, but I think if we can just have transparency around the data and just keep leaning in and getting better and better, I, I mean, 
soccer and sports, like, it does lift the world up. I mean, there, there's a reason why Nelson Mandela is up there talking about sports when he's, you know, unifying South Africa. It is this joyful way of bringing equity and making change in the world. And so I think we're both impatient, but also patient. So my call would be just more and more transparency around how much is going in and coming out. And hopefully we're there pretty fast. The team is getting chosen, right? In a way, this is kind of like auditions. Does that add an extra layer of excitement or nerves? I think it's competition and it's good competition, right? You want to perform well for your team so that your, your national team coach will recognize you and call you up. And we have players on the Canadian team and the Jamaican team and the Japanese team and the Scottish team. We'd really like to get some on the U.S. women's national team. So it starts today. For the 2023 World Cup, several Angel City players were chosen to play in the tournament, including two for the U.S. team. But despite their big splash, Angel City struggled to put up a winning record out of the gate, and the team fired its first head coach. Though there are challenges on the field ahead, few would have bet they'd come this far, this fast. So you're trying to build a soccer slash football club for the future. What does it look like? Let's say five, 10 years from now, what's changed? Angel City has sold out games every time we play, but more importantly, the other 12 and 14 teams in the league are also seeing sold out crowds. That they are investing in their players, investing in their community, building a product that people want to go see. And the excitement and the tension around women's football is national. Yeah. Carrie, you're launching this new thing, Monarch Collective, I believe it's called, where you're trying to help elevate women's sports and give people more investing power. Can you explain? Yeah, so it's going to be a dedicated pool of capital to invest in women's sports teams, leagues, and we think it'll be the first of its kind that's ex exclusively focused on women, but hopefully there will be many more that we collaborate with and help put in business and work alongside, you know, the men's funds. But if you bring the right kind of coalitions into the investment group that rep represent that community and represent different skill sets and you bring over playbooks from teams that are working in women's and men's sports we you know we can hopefully drive more outcomes more quickly across women's teams and leagues what what's our responsibility as parents and honestly i i'm feeling this now based on the things i've heard all of you say like i want my sons to wear kristen press jerseys and Alyssa thompson you know what can we do as parents to help help accelerate the culture change that we want to see i mean the easiest way is to, to watch the games um you know you can watch it at at home or you know, come in person if you're if you have the ability to come in in a city where there's games. But just to watch the games, I think is like that's why it's like it's very easy and fun. <laughs> you know, like it's not broccoli. Even if you're you know you fancy yourself progressive and a gender equity activist, we don't realize our own embedded sexism, misogyny, whatever it is. And I think Natalie's story is really telling. I think we all feel that way. Sometimes even we just assume our kids are going to have certain preferences and they don't. It's like they are growing up in a completely different reality than we are. And my favorite um, emails and texts afterwards are the ones I get which say, my 15 year old son does not want to miss an Angel City game. And so the power of growing up as a girl today, thinking you could be president or a professional athlete, there's power in that, but there's just as much power in like the men of tomorrow, seeing women in their power, sweating and loving it.